Here we are again on Loch Bora Organic Farm to film some more arable weeds. Red shank is one of the most pro prolific of arable weeds. Uh, it's a member of the dock family. Now the docks themselves and their relations, those are pollinated by the wind and we look at them on a different occasion. Uh, but red shank belongs to the large genus Polygonum. It has about 130 species and they're pollinated by insects. If you look at the plant, you can see immediately how it gets its name. The, the name in Greek, polygonum, actually means many jointed. And look, you can see there the, the, the way the stem is broken down up into sections separated by these what look like swollen joints. Uh, and the sections of the stem in between where they're facing the sun, you can see the way in which they take on a red colour, which explains the red part of the name. And red shank is the most familiar of a group of plants known as the Calvary plants or Golgotha plants. These are plants which have some structure that Christian piety interpreted to their having grown on Mount Calvary at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Uh, in the case of red shank, red shank was believed to have been a plant with spotless leaves growing at the foot of the cross and when drops of blood fell upon the leaves they were imprinted forever after with the mark of that horrible event. And uh, it's a very good example of the extent to which Christian imagery pervaded the rural imagination in the Middle Ages. The fruits of red shank are these blackish shiny nuts which are produced super abundantly uh, when the flowers are fertilized and these are like miniature time bombs. You see red shank is one of those arable weeds that thrives on freshly dug ground but can't stand competition. Red shank, however, has evolved a strategy for this. The seeds can remain dormant in the soil for up to 50 years. And when the ground is dug, dug up again, uh, they can germinate super abundantly, appearing as if from nowhere. And here are the flowers in tight terminal heads, individually rather small and insignificant, but super abundant and on that account important for smaller pollinating insects because of their late flowering. The flower has five sepals and no petals, red where they face the sun, paler elsewhere, even on individual flowers. There are eight stamens of which only five develop as a rule. The pistil is a flask-shaped structure with a forked style and two globular stigmas. Although both the anthers and stigmas are mature when the flowers open, the stamens stay out to the side of the flower, out of the way of the stigmas, giving visiting flies and bees a chance to effect cross-pollination. If that fails, they will produce a full head of seeds anyway. And here's our second species of polygonum. This is not grass. It's a sort of diminutive version of red shank. Uh, with wiry straggling stems often prostrate and the flowers here are not in terminal heads you can see they're in small groups in the axils of the leaves the angles that the leaves make with the stem uh, uh, one or two open at any one time in each of the clusters and it's a wonderful example not grass is a wonderful example of what a difference it makes uh, to have a hand lens which can magnify the individual flowers maybe 10 times so that you can really appreciate uh, the, the beauty of the small flowers. This gives me an opportunity to repeat one of my favourite phrases from Linnaeus. Natura in minimis maxime miranda. Nature is at its most to be marvelled at in the smallest creatures. The sepals, again not petals, are green, edged with pink or white, shortly overlapping and fused at the base. Here the eight stamens are all fertile. Remember in red shank three of the eight were inactive, five of them alternating with the sepals and keeping to the edge of the flower, the other three just above the two stigmas on which pollen falls freely. The flowers produce no nectar, although they receive occasional visits from small hoverflies such as Cerithipipiens. Numerous insects feed on the leaves, small moths prominent among them. Birds are particularly fond of these little seeds. In fact, that's what the specific part of the plant's Latin name echoes. Aviculare is from the Latin word for a bird, avis. 
The black seeds are like red shank, but finely striated, not shiny, and they can also remain dormant in the soil for ages. It's hard to believe that such an insignificant looking plant played an important part in human affairs at one time. Uh, in veterinary medicine, uh, if pigs were off colour and not eating, knotgrass was fed to restore their appetite and it had a whole range of medicinal applications. Uh, particularly perhaps it was used uh, for treating diarrhoea, bleeding piles, nosebleeds and uh, other hemorrhages. But one of the most astonishing things about knotgrass is that in prehistoric times it was used as human food. The seeds of knotgrass have been found in numerous bog bodies. Most famously and memorably, uh, knotgrass featured in the last porridge winter meal fed to Tolland Man, whose ritually slain 4th century BC body was dug up in a bog near Aarhus in Denmark in 1950 and which has achieved literary immortality in a chilling poem by Seamus Heaney. Someday I will go to Aarhus to see his peat brown head, the mild pods of his eyelids, his pointed skin cap. In the flat country nearby where they dug him out, his last gruel of winter seeds caked in his stomach. Naked except for the cap, noose and girdle, I will stand a long time, bridle to the goddess. She tightened her talk on him and opened her fen, those dark juices working him to a saint's kept body. Trove of the turf cutter's honeycombed workings, now his stained face reposes at Aarhus. <laughs>